Science-based lifting is obnoxious said the doctor, said the scientist. But why? This is the paradox that we need to solve today. How do two things that are objectively awesome, science and lifting, turn into the worst cancer to ever hit modern lifting culture? But before we get into it, what's up guys? Dr. Alex here, and I'm a board certified urologist and fellowship trained men's health specialist who hates golf, but kind of likes making YouTube videos. And I want to know what is the first thing that pops into your mind when you hear the term science-based lifting? Leave your answer in the comments down below and let's jump into it. Science. Ah, science. You know what? Science is awesome. It gave us penicillin, the internet, fake boobs that you can look at with said internet, and the ability to launch billionaires into space just so they can feel something for the first time in decades. And lifting, lifting is awesome. It makes you harder to kill, it quiets the voices in your head, at least temporarily, and it makes you look better naked. Notice I said better, not good. So logically, if you take thing A, which is awesome, and combine it with thing B, which is also awesome, you should theoretically get awesomer. That's just math. But instead, when you combine science and lifting in the year of our Lord 2020 something, you don't get a super soldier. You get a kid with the physique of a 13 year old girl, broccoli haircut, and a tripod yelling at you for resting two seconds too long, insisting you just missed the optimal window for hypertrophic signaling pathways. You get an identity and a culture that is obnoxious, neurotic, and completely out of touch with reality. Today, we're gonna explore how we let these dweebs ruin the gym, why bro science might have actually been right all along, and what we can do to avoid throwing the baby, AKA real actual science, out with the bathwater. Now, before we roast these Sheldon Cooper-esque optimizers, we have to define our terms. What exactly is science? If you go on TikTok or Instagram, you'd think science is a set of commandments written on stone tablets. I'm imagining a set of rules. Thou shalt only lift with full range of motion. Thou shalt never do bro splits. And thou must eat exactly 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram per body weight. Bro, that's not science. That's dogma. Science is not a list of facts. Science is a method. It is a process of inquiry. It is the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. The core spirit of science is skepticism. It's about saying, I have a hypothesis. Now let me try my absolute hardest to prove it wrong. Real science is humble. Real science looks at a complex system like the human body and says, we know some stuff, but there is an infinite amount of darkness we haven't even illuminated yet. You know, like the part of my brain that tells me if I miss this last rep, I'll bring irreparable shame upon my entire bloodline. The problem with the science-based lifting community is that they have abandoned the method of science for the aesthetic of science. They treat a single abstract from a 2014 study like it's the word of God, ignoring the fact that there have been three other studies since 2018 that contradict it. They trade curiosity for certainty, and in the world of biology, certainty is usually a lie. So to understand why this happened, we have to go back. We have to look at the environment that spawned this monster. You know, beyond the moms who clearly took too much Tylenol. Picture the fitness industry back in the early 90s all the way through the early 2000s. You know, when you could buy Superdraw at GNC. It was the Wild West, and the barrier to entry was massive. Fitness videos on the internet featured guys like Cali Muscle, who insisted his physique was the result of prison ramen instead of Chinese testosterone. So okay, maybe you pieced together enough money to buy some former Mr. Olympia's training programs. Never mind that those were designed for enhanced bodybuilders, not the skinny natural teens that they were marketed to. And God help you if you dared venture into some of the earliest bodybuilding forums where the typical beginner advice sounded something like, eat more, take your 500 milligrams of tests and shit up. So if you were a skinny, natural 16 year old like me, this advice didn't work. You'd try to train like your idols, but you'd just burn out. Your joints would start sounding like a rusty porch swing. And at the end, you'd still look the same. Knowledge was gatekept and it was incredibly infuriating. Enter the science-based movement. This was supposed to be our savior. Guys like Lyle McDonald, Alan Aragon, and then later the newer generation like Jeff Nippard and Jeremy Ethier started looking at the data and they said, hey, maybe we shouldn't train like drug enhanced genetic freaks if we aren't drug enhanced genetic freaks. Some might call that cope, I might call that a natural reaction. It was the pendulum swinging from bro science, which was seen as dumb, to real science, which was seen as smart. It appealed to our desire for truth. It promised a shortcut. It told us, you don't need to guess, we have the data. And for a while, it was good. We stopped doing dumb stuff. We learned about energy balance. The masses finally learned about progressive overload. But then, as all movements do, it went too far and began to rot from the inside. Here's the dirty little secret that the influencers citing PubMed in their captions won't tell you. Exercise is, by and large, kind of weak. 
I don't mean the scientists are weak, although many of them are. Some of them are fantastic. I mean the quality of data that we can extract from resistance training studies is inherently limited. Limitation number one is the subjects. Do you know who participates in exercise science studies? Broke college kids, untrained 19 year olds who need 50 bucks for beer money. And here's the problem. Everything works on untrained beginners. You could have a beginner wave a dumbbell at a passing car and they would undergo hypertrophy. So when a study says X training method produced 10 more growth than Y method, but the subjects had never touched a barbell before, that data is almost useless to you. Hopefully someone who's been lifting for at least five years or more. Even if you haven't, that's fine. Like and subscribe. Limitation number two is duration. Real muscle growth takes years. Most studies last eight to 12 weeks. We are trying to extrapolate what builds a championship physique over a decade based on what happened to a sophomore named Tyler during his spring semester. Limitation number three, mechanism versus outcome. And this is a big one. The science-based crowd loves to obsess over mechanisms. This exercise activates the mTOR pathway. This movement has a higher EMG activation in the lateral head. Cool, does that actually translate to bigger muscles? Often, we don't know. Just because a pathway is signaled doesn't mean protein synthesis is maximizing. They mistake the map for the actual terrain, and they get so bogged down in the microscopic details, the optimizing, that they miss the forest for the trees. They will argue for three hours about whether a seated hamstring curl is 4% better than a lying leg curl due to the length tension relationship while ignoring the fact that they aren't training with any intensity whatsoever. And this is what brings me to what I think is the funniest part of this whole saga. The bros, the guys the science nerds spent 15 years mocking, were actually right about a lot of stuff. So you know what? Let's have some fun. Let's bring up the scoreboard. The bros said, you gotta feel the muscle working. Mind muscle connection, baby. The science-based crowd says, internal cues are inferior. You should focus on moving the weight from A to B. And the verdict is new research shows that for hypertrophy, that mind muscle connection actually matters. Focusing on the muscle can increase activation and growth signals in isolation movements. Points for the bros. The bros say, I'm doing a bro split. Chest on Monday, back on Tuesday. The science-based crowd says, you idiot, frequency is king. You must hit every muscle two to three times a week or you are wasting your life. And the verdict is that when volume is equated, frequency doesn't matter nearly as much as we thought. If you smash chest on Monday with enough volume, you can grow just as well as the guy hitting it three times that week. The bro split is scientifically valid. Point number two to the bros. Moving on, bros say, train till you drop. The science-based crowd says, leave three reps in reserve, manage fatigue, RPE seven. The verdict is, while yes, you shouldn't kill yourself, we are finding that most people are terrible at estimating reps in reserve. When people think they have two reps left, they usually have 10. The bros training to failure were actually ensuring they got an effective stimulus, while the science guys were just warming up for six months straight. Point to the bros, again. The bros arrived at these truths through decades of trial and error, which is, ironically, a form of empirical science. The science-based crowd just read an abstract and decided that they knew better. Now we have to address the elephant in the room, which is the culture. Science-based lifting has ceased to become a methodology. It's become a fashion statement. It's a subculture of douchey kids with broccoli perms, the zoomer perm or bird's nest, and the physique of 12-year-olds. You know the look. They walk into the gym after school in their pajamas and Crocs. They set up a tripod that takes up more space than a deadlift platform, and they spend 45 minutes warming up their rotator cuffs because a YouTuber told them they have suboptimal internal rotation. I have to warm up my rotator cuffs because I'm old, and my culture is not your costume. And scientifically speaking, I think this is where the terms fake and gay apply. And I don't mean gay in the cool way, like two pretty ladies kissing respectfully in their Subaru at the end of their customary 72 hour first date. That's culture, that's art, and I am here for it. I mean gay in the late 90s middle school sense way and that it's performative. It's pretending to be about data when really you're compensating for your bruised ego by pretending you're smarter than the guy who's twice your size. It's a culture that values being right over being strong. It's a culture where you get dogpiled in the TikTok comment section for doing a movement that isn't biomechanically perfect by a kid who's never benched more than 135 pounds. This is a subculture that has taken the raw visceral joy of lifting heavy weights, a primitive struggle where you simultaneously fight gravity while trying to earn your father's love, and they turned it into a spreadsheet. They've sanitized it and they've castrated it. And the worst part, they aren't even getting better results. They're just getting more obnoxious. 
My parting hypothesis is this. Science-based lifting isn't scientific at all. It's a dogmatic, narrow-minded religion that fails to account for the infinite variables present in a weightlifting environment. It's akin to co-opting the name of something that should be awesome on paper and then turning it into an absolute dumpster fire whose followers end up looking like complete tools. So, is that it? Are we done with science? Do we burn the textbooks and go back to injecting vegetable oil in a basement? Absolutely not. This is the danger. Because the science-based community has become so annoying, the reaction is to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're seeing a return to anti-intellectualism and fitness, where people are saying science is fake, just lift. But that's wrong too. Real science is awesome. Understanding biomechanics does help you avoid injury. Understanding nutrition does help you hit goals more efficiently. We shouldn't ignore data, but we do need to change our relationship with it. And some creators are following through with this. Jeremy Ethier just came out with a fantastic video where he spent $40,000 funding his own study, looking at MRI results to see, does the stretch really matter? And I encourage you to go check out that video. Now, if you've made it this far in my rant, here are four key gut checks that you should filter all new information through as you continue on your fitness journey. Number one, be a pragmatist, not a dogmatist. Science is a compass, not a one-to-one -one map. It can point you in the general right direction, eat protein, sleep, and use progressive overload, but you've got to walk that path yourself. Number two, respect the N of one. You are a sample size of one. If a study says squats are the best for quads, but squats hurt your knees and you feel like leg presses are better, do the leg press. That's being scientific about your own body. Number three, embrace a spirit of skepticism. When an influencer tells you that you are killing your gains because you didn't eat 30 grams of dextrose intra workout, be skeptical. Ask yourself, does this actually matter or is this guy just trying to sell me pink powder with his affiliate code? Number four, train hard. At the end of the day, the variable that the science-based crowd ignores most is effort because it's really hard to measure. A suboptimal program executed with violent intensity will always be a scientifically perfect program executed with half-assed effort. So don't let the broccoli heads ruin science for you. Read the papers, but also listen to the big sweaty guy in the corner. He might just know something that the latest abstract hasn't figured out yet. All right. Like, comment, subscribe, and send this to your friends so I can keep paying Ronick. This is Dr. Alex, signing off.